I knew that Khmer Rouge had to be put on trial. And in so doing, I began to think about genocide. It was really the first time I thought about genocide very deeply. And that's how I got involved. And I started the Cambodian Genocide Project when I was just a student at Yale Law School. So if you think you have to wait until you're out of school to start changing the world, get over it. You can start now. I know students of mine who, in fact, were freshmen at Mary Washington University in Virginia who started a project in Honduras that in its first three years raised $3 million to rebuild an orphanage and an entire village there. And these were college kids. They also had high school chapters. There's also a group called STAND, for instance, that has high school chapters and college chapters. I recommend that you look into that because setting up a chapter of STAND in your high school would be a really positive thing. And that was begun by students at Mary Washington? That was the students of Mary Washington started a project called Students Helping Honduras that raised the money for that orphanage and that village in Honduras. But yes, it was students who started STAND. It was during the Save Darfur movement in around 2003. And the STAND project got started. It's still going today. It's still led by students. So look into it. It's really a good project. It's one of our members in the Alliance Against Genocide, which Genocide Watch coordinates. Anyway, enough said. You can read my biography on our website, so I won't go into it. You can also hear the TED Talk, so I won't go into that either. But I will say this, that it's a calling. This work against genocide is a vocation. It's a calling. It is something that reaches out to you and takes hold of your life. I don't mean that everybody who is involved has to give their whole life over to it. That's what I've done. But, you know, we need the work of people from all walks of life. We need businessmen. We need lawyers. We need accountants. We need people who are all kinds of people all over the world to work on this problem. And I'm convinced, in fact, that education is the key. You are doing exactly what's needed. Because understanding genocide is the first step to preventing it. You are among the first people to study genocide in high school. I don't know how unique you realize you are, but you are. Very few teachers, like Keith Eaton, are teaching their students in high school about genocide. So I'm really happy and glad to be here today to talk to you about this. Now, how many of you in the class, raise your hands if you will, how many of you in the class have taken a look at the Genocide Watch website? Anybody? A few. Good. Most people. Okay, well, that's the place to go first if you want to study genocide. There are others as well, of course. But Genocide Watch was the first anti-genocide organization in the world. And we also started the first international coalition against genocide, which is still going today. The Alliance Against Genocide now has over 70 members around the world, 70 member organizations. And there's some of them that are really big, like the International Crisis Group, Aegis Trust, Minority Rights Group, Survival International, Physicians for Human Rights. I mean, you can read about them in the news. You won't read about us very much in the news because we intentionally remain small. Our idea was to be a catalyst for other groups to form. And that's exactly what's happened. Now, these groups each sets their own agenda. There are groups in Rwanda, there are groups in Iraq, there are groups in Myanmar and lots of places around the world that need this work done. Sudan, 
And so we um, we expect them to set the agendas there. That's basically how the alliance works. Um, now, just as a uh, brief uh, note, um, what I learned in work against genocide is you have to be willing to change jobs. <laughs> uh, so I went from being in law school to becoming a law professor, and then I left that to join the State Department in the Clinton administration. I say, you know, Bill Clinton administration. Uh, and um, that was when, of course, the Rwandan genocide occurred, as well as the Bosnian genocide, and uh, East Timor, and um, a number of others, the beginning of the Congolese genocides. Um, so it was a time when genocide was really on the minds of people in the State Department, and I happened to be just at the right place at the right time. And so they summoned me, um, as the Director General said to me when she called me back to Washington to work on the Rwandan genocide, um, she said, you're the only genocide expert we have in the Foreign Service. And I said, you got to be kidding. And she was not kidding because there were not experts on genocide because nobody had really sat down and studied it. Most diplomats aren't lawyers. They most, mostly haven't seen a genocide themselves. Uh, so it became an effort to educate other diplomats also in the State Department. That's when I wrote what was then, at the beginning, the eight stages of genocide, because it was a, it was an attempt to present to diplomats uh, a model that would help them understand the process of genocide, to predict it when it comes. And not just to predict it, but also to suggest steps that could be taken at each stage to stop it. That's the whole idea of the eight stages model. Now, it's not just a probability model. Some people in this field um, have very good probability models. Uh, you know, Barbara Harp, for instance, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and others try to add up factors that would uh, make you worry about a particular country and then they predict that this country is likely to have genocide. Well, um, that's useful and we do use those models. But what is more important is to know when genocide is going to happen and how it happens. How does it build up and then um, occur? Because it's not an accident. And it's also not really um, unpredictable the way a hurricane is or a earthquake. Now, you could almost say that earthquakes aren't quite unpredictable or hurricanes, and yet they're really very hard to predict. Genocides actually are easier to predict than those. Uh, the problem is doing something to stop them, even if you have a prediction you still got to have the political will to do something to stop it. That's why I think education is so important, because I've learned from experience now that stopping genocide is best done at the local and national level of the country where it is likely to happen. People in that country are most able to stop it. And so if you can build up a movement within those countries, you can educate people, so they know to see the signs, um, then that is the best way you can prevent genocide. I've learned that sending in the Marines, as, as you will, I mean, uh, sending in armies to try to stop genocide after it's begun is usually too late because usually thousands of people have already died. But that is, doesn't mean that if you have a genocide and it is going on, that you shouldn't send Marines and you shouldn't send armies to try to stop it. I'm convinced, in fact, at a time when a genocide is, is hot, when it's underway, as it was in Rwanda, for instance, um, as it was in Bosnia, um, and you know, as it is right now, I believe, in, in Myanmar and in Sudan, I do think sending in armies sometimes is necessary. But what kind of army? That's the question. Is it an army that is really going to 
try to, you know, kill all the perpetrators? Well, if you try to do that in the genocide, often you have hundreds of thousands of perpetrators. It takes a lot of people to conduct a genocide. So not, that's not necessarily the way to do it. Uh, there may be a lot of other means before that, and that's what we encourage, sanctions, uh, diplomatic pressure, all kinds of other stuff to really stop the leaders from doing genocide. Okay, that's pretty much uh, sort of my introduction. I was in the State Department. I got to work on the Rwanda genocide. I was the guy who uh, wrote the resolutions that created the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And I also was able then later to write the rules and, you know, bring about the creation of the Cambodian Tribunal. Uh, in the meantime, also worked on the Sierra Leone Tribunal, uh, East Timor Tribunal, uh, the International Criminal Court, and a whole lot of other ways in which we try people who have committed genocide. But one of the things that I learned from this is that it's too late if you have to put them on trial. Courts only happen after a genocide is over, pretty much. So we need to prevent and that's the reason why you're so important in this whole start. Now, I had a lot of uh, questions, um, so I think I'll just go on to them. Is that okay, uh, yeah. Keith? That's great. Uh, what about you guys? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, just, we'll just add on. Yeah. We'll on. Yeah. I mean, these were really good questions, so I was very pleased that you sent them. Um, really good questions. A lot of them very probing. I had some that were really interesting to me, ones that I'd never heard before. Like, can you buy a genocide? I love that one. Uh, I mean, how, how, many even, how many people even think about this? You know, that's a really good question. Uh, okay, how I, I talked about how to get involved. Uh, that was the first question. And then somebody asked, what's the definition of genocide? Again, look at our website. We've got a question. In the, on the website, what is genocide, that will answer that question. But just to give you a very brief answer, genocide is defined as the intentional destruction in whole or in part of a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Now that means four groups are covered by the Genocide Convention. National, ethnic, racial, and religious groups. Why aren't political groups or economic groups or cultural groups covered? Because the Soviet Union and other countries, Brazil and some others, didn't want them covered. Because they realized if they were covered, then those countries would be guilty. Uh, there were Americans also who didn't want the Genocide Convention because of our history of segregation and slavery. And also, of, frankly, our genocide against Native Americans. So it, this is a real political issue, and um, those groups were excluded from the Genocide Convention itself. Uh, that doesn't mean we exclude them. At Genocide Watch, we use the definition in the Genocide Convention uh, for legal purposes, but for preventive purposes, we use the broader definition that was uh, a definition by the father of the Genocide Convention, Raphael Lemkin, uh, when he defined genocide, and I will write, read this definition to you because it's still the best, I think. He said, genocide is a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of the central foundations of the life of national groups. Now, when he meant national groups, he was also talking about these other groups. Uh, ethnic, racial, religious, and so forth, with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. The objectives of such a plan would be the disintegration of the political and social institutions of culture, language, national feelings, religion, and the economic existence of national groups, and the destruction of the personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of the individuals belonging to such groups. In other words, you'll notice his definition is, is way broader than the genocide conventions. This made the politicians who were writing the convention very uncomfortable. So they struck it out. 
That's why cultural genocide, which I think should be included, isn't in the convention. We include it. We think that what's happened to Native Americans in the United States, which is cultural genocide, should be included. Now, of course, they also had physical genocide against them. Just read the history of New England. You'll see why you don't have that many Indian groups left in, in New England. They were slaughtered. Uh, and the same went in the West. Uh, so it's not just, you know, a matter of, of killing, though. It also can be, and here's where we get to the definition that is, you have to really remember, it's not just killing members of the group, it's also causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Also, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, that's exactly what we did here in the United States. We took away Indian children, put them in um, church-run um, schools where they were forbidden to speak their Indian languages and where they were not allowed essentially to be Indians. They wanted to turn them all into little white people and uh, ex you know, eradicate their own culture. That's a genocide. It's right in the convention, actually. We took away their children. And so did Canada, and so did Australia. And it's gone on again and again and again. That's what the Khmer Rouge did in Cambodia to the Chan Muslim minority, took away their children. Wouldn't let them speak Chan, so forth. So these kinds of genocide really are still part of the convention. Okay. So, the question then was, is genocide dependent on intent? Is it an intentional crime? The answer to that is yes. The way it's defined in the convention, it says the intentional destruction in whole or in part. In other words, it's not the accidental destruction. Uh, some people confuse this, this term, for instance. They talk about the genocide at Bhopal for instance, where there was a chemical leak that, you know, went all around the town and killed literally thousands of people in India. Well, it wasn't a genocide, it was an accident. That is not intentional. Now, you can argue that it might have been reckless in that they had a similar chemical skip, uh, spill, Union Carbide, in their West Virginia plant. That's reckless, but it's not intentional. So, yes, intent is very important. Now, the reason why this is a problem, <laughs> according to a lot of lawyers, is it's always difficult to prove intent. How are you going to prove intent? Do you have to re have an order signed by Adolf Hitler saying kill all the Jews? Well, that order has never been found. Uh, you know, do you have to have actual commands that say kill everybody? Now, we have a few genocides where that's actually happened. In the Herero genocide in Southwest Africa, what is now Namibia, the German general actually said, kill them all, uh, about the Hereros. Uh, and we've also had a few other cases where it says, where the commanders have actually said that, or, or you know, have put it in writing, kill them all. That's very rare. Usually, you can prove intent by a systematic pattern of actions. You know, if you have literally hundreds or thousands of killings, and they all aim at a particular group. Say, for example, in Darfur, where the only people who are killed are members of the African groups, the Four, Masali, uh, and uh, the other black African groups, and they leave the Arabs alone, then, well, you know that's intentional. It's not an accident that they're just singling out black African groups. Uh, so that kind of intent, which is called specific intent by lawyers, namely you have to prove that the specific intent was to kill that group or to destroy that group, uh, that is something that stands in the way of uh, the lawyer's concept of genocide in many cases. Now I think, frankly, lawyers are way too finicky about that. Uh, I think it's a lot easier to prove intent uh, than some of the lawyers do. Uh, you know, at the, when they wrote the Genocide Convention, nobody talked about specific intent. They just talked about intent. 
The intent they talked about was the kind of intent a killer has when he's holding a gun, he's pointing it at your head, and he squeezes the trigger. Well, did he intend to kill you? Sure, he did. How do you prove the intent? You don't have to psychoanalyze the guy. You just have to prove he squeezed the trigger. Well, that's the way I think it is with genocide. That's why it really is a word that should be used a lot more than it is. Some people say, oh, don't cheapen the word. I don't think it cheapens the word to actually call a spade a spade. I think you need to call it what it is. That's what's happening to Rohingya, for instance, right now in Myanmar, in Burma. They are victims of genocide. And yet the United Nations and our own Secretary of State doesn't have the guts to call it what it is. Instead, they call it ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing? Give me a break. That was a word invented by Slobodan Milosevic, one of the worst genocidists in history. He said, it's ethnic cleansing. It's not genocide. Well, folks, that's called a euphemism. Now, I'm sure in English class you have read about euphemisms. Euphemisms are sort of soft terms to hide the ugly term underneath. The ugly term is genocide. And that's what ethnic cleansing really is. Uh, now, the question then is, okay, uh, the second question that was raised was how do you create this list of stages of genocide? Well, um, I'm a cultural anthropologist as well as a lawyer. I have a PhD from University of Chicago in anthropology, and we're cultural anthropologists out there. We try to figure out how people think. Uh, and what we learned about how people think is people think in structured ways. What I mean is there are predictable patterns of the way people think. And after you sat down in a culture long enough and talked to enough people, you can often figure out what those structural patterns are. Uh, in rituals, for instance, just to give you an example, uh, a rite of passage ritual where a boy becomes a man or a girl becomes a woman, there are always three stages, always. First, there's a separation from the previous stage, a boyhood or girlhood, and there is a, what they call a liminal period in which, you know, you're kind of between, you're betwixt and between, uh, and then finally there's a reincorporation into the new status, that you're a man or a woman. Those are the three stages, and you can predict it all around the world. I actually wrote my master's thesis at the University of Chicago on the movie The Graduate. If you, if you get a chance to see that movie, it is a rite of passage movie, and it uses those stages. And so do all of the other rites of passage movies of that type. Anyway, we use those stages. So do people in the Yoruba culture in, in Nigeria. So do people in the Ivory Coast, where I work. Everywhere, people use those same stages. Well, what, we, what I learned was, if you think about human behavior in terms of the processes that occur when people do things, you come down to definite structures, to stages. You, um, you can see this in the model. That's what I realized. I began to think about it in Cambodia when I realized that um, the people who were marked for death in the eastern zone of Cambodia were always given a blue and white check scarf. They were then transferred to a different part of Cambodia because the uh, Khmer Rouge said they had Khmer bodies, that means Cambodian bodies, but Vietnamese minds. So how do you mark them? Well, you give them a special marker, a blue and white check scarf. How did the Nazis mark the Jews? We know that, don't we? The yellow star was how they tried to mark the Jews. So what I saw was, first of all, as the first stage, which was classification. Classification is these are Jews, and here we are, we're Germans, so we gotta we gotta exclude them from our classification. That's exactly, by the way, what's happened in the Rohingya in Myanmar right now. They are literally excluded from citizenship in Myanmar. So that classification state is, was 
very clear. And it was clear in Cambodia too, where they divided the society into what they called uh, new people and old people. And the old people uh, was a good kind of person, a peasant, and they said, those are the people we really want in our society, these new people, these city dwellers, these capitalists, these property owners and so forth, you don't want them, so we're going to kill them all. That kind of classification, uh, it can be deadly. That's what it was in, in, Khmer, in Khmer Rouge, uh, Cambodia. It's what it was in um, Rwanda. In Rwanda, if you were a Tutsi, you were dead. Uh, in in uh, Europe, under the Nazis, if you were a Jew, you were dead. So that kind of classification is really crucial. That's the first stage. And the second one, which is symbolization, is also very evident. You can see it. Uh, well, I started thinking about that, and I realized, you know what? There are a lot of other stages that lead to genocide. And so I sat down and started to figure them out. And I studied, in particular, the Holocaust, uh, the Rwanda genocide, the Cambodian genocide, the Armenian genocide, a number of these genocides, all of which had mass killing as their result, and every single one of them had the same stages of development. And so that's when I sat down and I wrote out this, this stage model for my fellow diplomats in the State Department so they could understand and see it coming. Uh, and then also know what to do about it. Because it, say for example, the classification stage, if you can stop that, you've stopped genocide. In other words, if you can argue that these Rohingya ought to get their citizenship back, and they ought to have the citizenship, and they should be treated as full citizens of Myanmar with all the rights, then you will stop the process. Uh, similarly, uh, in Bulgaria, for instance, the symbolization stage got stopped. The Nazis weren't able to get the Bulgarians to put yellow stars on their Jews. The president of Bulgaria, even though he was cooperating with the Nazis on most other things, said, no, 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 these are Bulgarians. We're not putting any stars on these people. And so did the head of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church. They said, you know, you can take your stars and uh, throw them in the river. We're not going to put them on Jews. And so it wasn't, in fact, until the Nazis took direct control of Germans, direct control of Bulgaria, that any stars got put on Jews there. Result, they stopped the symbolization stage. They absolutely would symbolize the Jews, and it therefore became very hard to know who was Jewish unless you really had local knowledge. Uh, well, um, the result was in uh, Bulgaria, they only lost 13% of their Jewish population compared to, say, you know, 70 or 80% in most of the other European countries. Uh, in Denmark, they were totally uh, able to stop the civilization stage. In fact, the king said, if you're going to put yellow stars on Danish Jews, I'm going to be the first one to wear one. You see, a symbol can be deprived of its meaning. If it doesn't mean anything, then of course it's useless. So essentially that was what the king was saying he was going to do. Well, the Danes wouldn't even put on the yellow stars, they, and the Germans gave up. They said, we're not going to even try with the Danes. And also the Danes managed to smuggle all of their Jews across the uh, channels of Sweden to safety. They literally saved all of their Jews in Denmark. So this is the kind of way in which a stage model can be useful in preventing genocide. If you know how it's developing, for instance, uh, the next stages, as you know, in this model are discrimination. If you have a strong, uh, a strong legal uh, barrier to discrimination in a society, uh, you can really stop that stage in its tracks. Now, as you know, in this country, we had segregation for many, many years. Uh, I mean, I when I was growing up, if I went to the South, there were colored water fountains and there were white water fountains. And I was a civil rights worker, I saw it myself. Uh, you know, and black people had to be in the back of the bus and things of that kind. The, all these discriminatory laws were there. They couldn't vote, essentially, because of uh, voting, voting laws. 
which by the way is a battle we're still fighting. Uh, the segregationists down south are still trying to keep black people from voting by and enacting really difficult to uh, to uh, follow voting laws. Uh, and that sort of discrimination also supposed to discriminate against them in uh, everything else. I mean, employment, and you name it. Uh, black people in this country who are the descendants of slaves were still being discriminated against a full hundred years after the so-called end of slavery. Civil Rights Act of the 1960s, 1964, 65, 66, the Voting Rights Act particularly was important because it gave black people the vote. And that is a powerful tool. And we just saw it in Alabama. Black people and uh, I'd say enlightened uh, Republicans and Democrats refused to put a racist pedophile in the Senate. They said, sorry guys, we may have this, uh, you know, uh, tradition and boy are we Southerners, but we're not going to do that. And so they actually elected a guy who was against all that. And now that vote was because it was made possible because of the Voting Rights Act of 1966. I was a civil rights worker down there and went around and tried to get uh, people to vote, to I mean to register to vote, black people. We stayed at their houses and so forth. Uh, the Ku Klux Klan followed us around and shot up our house one night, wounded a couple of my friends. Now you talk about terrorism, that is a terrorist group. I know, I've seen it. My own friends were wounded by them. And, you know, this was USA. And they're making a comeback. These white racists are making a comeback. And you better watch out, because that is the kind of warning sign in our own country that we should be very much aware of. Uh, we have no tolerance of genocide watch for any kind of racism. The racism of uh, black Marxists, for instance, in South Africa is something we will not tolerate either. They want to take away all the land from whites and drive out all the whites from South Africa. That is just, that's just racism of a different kind. Uh, we're totally opposed to it. And they say, well, you know, look what the whites did here in South Africa. They had apartheid and they were uh, discriminating against us. But that doesn't justify the kind of racism that some of these Marxists want to impose on South Africa. I just don't think that's right. And so you move on, of course, to the other stages, dehumanization. If you see somebody being called a cockroach or a rat or something like that, you know you're on your way to genocide. That's exactly what happened in Rwanda. It's exactly what happened in the Holocaust. Jews were called rats, filth, cancers, and so forth. In, in Rwanda, the uh, Tutsis were called cockroaches. Um, that's dehumanization. Uh, the, another stage, of course, the next one, organization, you can really strike hard against that stage. You can basically uh, make it impossible for these criminal organizations to organize. That's what finally, when Bobby Kennedy told J. Edgar Hoover, look, you go after the Klan or we're going to go after you, and they finally did go after the Klan and basically brought it down. And the Southern Poverty Law Center is still doing that, by the way, down in, uh, in uh, Alabama. Uh, they, you have to keep on your guard all the time against these guys. Uh, the Aryan Nations, the Southern Poverty Relation Law Center, this is a white uh, racist group up in Idaho and elsewhere, uh, they, they sued them for, for um, violent acts against an Indian woman. They, they bankrupted them. That kind of tactic, essentially hitting the organization right where it hurts in the money, is really very helpful. Also, criminalizing it. We have a statute in the United States called the RICO statute, the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, which allows us to sweep down and take whole gangs and whole mafia groups, whole mafia families, take them all into custody on the same day, confiscate all their property, essentially put them all in jail. Now that is a really tough law. It has very high standards. You gotta really prove that this is a criminal conspiracy. 
I mean, they can't just go after you know any group they want. But that kind of law can be very potent. In Germany, if you declare that you're organizing a Nazi party, they are going to arrest you. They've had enough of Nazis. And if you put a swastika up on the wall in Germany, you're going to get arrested for it. Uh, that doesn't happen here because we have such a strong First Amendment right to express ourselves and so forth. I sometimes wonder, actually, if our right to uh, express ourselves isn't maybe a little too absolute here in this country when you've got all these hate-filled uh, websites, pro-Nazi, you know, pro-racist, and so forth websites. Even terrorists can put stuff up on the web. Um, I personally wonder about that. Maybe they should be taken down, those websites. Um, anyway, uh, that's how the stage has really developed. Um, and they've, uh, I've added a couple, by the way. Uh, I added two stages when some of my colleagues in this field said, you know, you really uh, need to add discrimination to your model. And they were right, so I did. And they said, and persecution. You know, when people get sent off to concentration camps or, you know, when their properties uh, confiscated and so forth, you got to add that one too. And I did. So this model is not some kind of, you know, handed down, you know, from uh, Mount Sinai kind of a model. Uh, this is a model uh, that was just developed by me as a kind of a useful, logical way to understand genocide. And I'm sure others will improve on it. Um, okay. Now, were the 10 stages visible within the London genocide, one of you asked? Absolutely, every one of them. Uh, they classified the society into Tutsis, Hutus, and Twa. Now, that means the pygmy population. They um, also then symbolized that on ID cards in which they actually had you identified as a Tutsi or a Hutu uh, or a Twa or a naturalized which meant some sort of other. Uh, they uh, discriminated against Tutsis by not, by, for instance, preventing uh, any more than a certain small percentage uh, in their law schools, their medical schools, their all kinds of schools, and, and in a lot of contracts in government ministries and so forth. In other words, they discriminated against Tutsis. Uh, they dehumanized Tutsis, as I've just said, by calling them cockroaches. And by a huge propaganda campaign by a hate radio station called Vision of the Thousand Hills uh, that broadcast nonstop hate propaganda against Tutsis. Uh, and it was used during the genocide, in fact, directly uh, for incitement. Such and such is driving down this road, stop them, kill them. I mean, that kind of incitement to genocide, that's what you call direct uh, incitement, is, um, was very evident. They organized, they had a group called the inter a uh, militia that uh, was organized by the hate, uh, the, the uh, Hutu power movement, uh, and the inter were then trained, given weapons, given machetes, uh, and clubs and even other and, and guns and so forth. Uh, that's the organization stage. Um, they had training camps for these people. Uh, they then went, they polarized the society. That was the next stage. Uh, and uh, they basically said, if you're not with us, you're against us. And they classified all the moderate Hutus who were against genocide as being really belonging to the Tutsis. So that was polarization, and then and the first people, by the way, in a genocide to be killed are often people from the group that's doing the killing who have opposed the killers and who, who are, you know, they, they classify them as being part of the enemy. Uh, and that's what happened in Rwanda. Uh, a moderate Hutu prime minister was one of the first people to be killed, and my friend, the head of the Supreme Court there, who was a moderate Hutu, was also killed on the first day of the genocide. In the Holocaust, the first people to be arrested were liberal priests, liberal pastors, uh, social democrats, I mean socialists, uh, communists, uh, other people who opposed the Nazis. And they were the first ones to go to the uh, concentration camp um, at Dachau, the first concentration camp. 
It wasn't Jews. Later, of course, then they brought in the Jews and others. But moderates are often the people targeted first. Then you had planning. Uh, first preparation, we call it the stage. Uh, the Nazis actually sat down and planned out the Holocaust. There's a very famous conference at Bonsai, a, a, uh, a villa on the edge of Berlin, where the Nazi leaders got together and literally planned out the Holocaust. If you want to see a really chilling movie, you should watch Conspiracy, a movie about that conference. And it uses the transcript from that conference that was actually sat, and somebody sat there and took down the, what people said at that conference. They tried to destroy all the copies of the transcripts, but one survived, and it was on that transcript that this movie is based. I mean, it will make, it will send chills up and down your spine, listening to these people. There was Eichmann was there, and uh, a number of the others who planned the Holocaust. Uh, and then, of course, you had persecution. That was, um, you know, marking the Jewish homes and the Jewish businesses, the sending of the Jews into ghettos uh, in uh, many of the cities that were conquered by the Nazis, uh, the actual construction of concentration camps and uh, so forth. And then they began the next stage, which was extermination, mass killing. The first was done, uh, you know, by groups called the Night Einsatz Group, and special military battalions in Eastern Europe who lined up Jews next to mass graves and just shot them all. What they found out, though, was it was so hard on the psyches of the people who were doing the killing, shooting, the, shooting, the, shooting the Jews, that they really thought that was not a very good method. Uh, it was causing too much, we now know, PTSD among their own soldiers. So that's when they moved over to the gas chambers and built these huge extermination prisons, camps like Auschwitz, uh, Birkenau, like uh, the uh, the many, many, many others, Soviet War. I mean, there's just a huge gulag of extermination prisons in Nazi Germany. Um, and finally then, the stage is denial. The, uh, Nazis denied they'd done anything wrong. They said we didn't really do that. Of course, the Nuremberg uh, court said, yes, you did, and you're guilty, and convicted most of the people who were tried there. And then those trials went on later. Many other people were convicted after Nuremberg. The same is what we realized we needed to do about the uh, Rwandan genocide, because otherwise people would deny they did it. The best way to counter denial is to put people on trial. Okay, so then the question is, what about trials where they happen very late? I have a special knowledge of that one because of Cambodia. We didn't have court to try the Khmer Rouge leaders until 25 years after the Khmer Rouge. But it wasn't too late. We were still able to get a lot of the top leaders put them on trial. Now we didn't get many. We only were eight. We only really wanted to get top leaders because that was a top-down genocide. It was really decided by a very small group of people. So then, what about somebody like Rios Montt in uh, Guatemala, who from 1982 to 1983 in Guatemala oversaw a genocide against uh, the Mayan Indians there? who he classified as communist sympathizers. That was their whole excuse for the genocide. Uh, they killed at least 100,000, probably more than that, uh, of the Mayans. And this general was, you know, he was the president. He was in charge of the country. Uh, just in a couple of years, he did that. Now, he, there have been other, there had been other killings of Mayans and so forth, but this was a general that and he even became a member of the legislature, of the parliament, and he had parliamentary immunity. What do you do with somebody like that? First of all, they tried to hide the records. Uh, it turned out that the uh, records had been very carefully kept and hidden away, and they finally discovered those records. And when they did, then investigations began that could show that Rios Mont and his, his troops in Guatemala were guilty as hell of this genocide. 
And so they finally held the trial many years after the genocide and convicted him. They convicted him of the genocide. The, the evidence was overwhelming. But guess what? Riosman and his party had appointed the Supreme Court. So they got their friends on the Supreme Court to reverse the conviction. So they had to put him on trial again. And then they decided they really couldn't put him on trial anymore because he, by that time, was mentally uh, incapable. He had, he had developed dementia. So what do you do when you've got that kind of impunity, you know, where he literally got away with murder? Well, you put other people on trial as well. That's one thing. You also can do something because um, somebody asked the question, well, what do you do about all the other people who were involved in the genocide? Because it wasn't just Rios Mont, and it wasn't just the Khmer Rouge leaders, after all, and it wasn't just the uh, generals who led the uh, Rwanda genocide. It was also lots of other people who did the killing, too. Well, in my opinion, the best example of what to do about that is what's happened in Rwanda, where they uh, used a traditional African system of justice called the gachacha trials. That means sitting on the grass in their language. Gachacha means sitting on the grass, trials. There's an old judicial system that they used to, you know, just resolve disputes between people. Uh, they held over 100,000 of these trials for, you know, local killers. And then either sentenced them to prison or they would usually send them to things like community service. You know, if the guy had killed off the family of a woman who was left without any family to help her, uh, you know, to uh, till her fields and so forth, they would sentence the guy to do her farming the rest of his life. Uh, that's called community service. It's pretty heavy community service. But the other thing that happened there, as a result of these so-called trials, is that the church intervened. The church had, which had failed during the Rwandan genocide, it was just as divided as the rest of society, it didn't speak out, and it should have. But by this time, the church realized its failure, and a lot of the church leaders, the priests and others, encouraged reconciliation between the victims and the killers. And a lot of that has happened in Rwanda. Uh, there's a film about it called As We Forgive uh, that I recommend very highly about two women and how they came to forgive their, their family's killers. Uh, that's rare, of course, and it's based on a kind of forgiveness that I think is made possible in Rwanda because of the fact that they're Christians in Rwanda. Um, over 85% of the people in Rwanda are Christians. It, it's not just Christians, of course. Forgiveness is part of the Muslim tradition as well. It's not just Christians. But I do think the religion had a huge impact in Rwanda. I also think it had a big impact in South Africa, where there wasn't genocide, but there was this 300 years, uh, essentially, of racial segregation and apartheid. Uh, and they um, had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that really helped to heal that society. So those kinds of ways of dealing with impunity, I think, are very useful. Uh, somebody asked about you know, the role of the president of Bosnia, Radovan Karadzic. Uh, and then of his general, uh, Ratko Mladic, who carried out the Srebrenica massacre in 1995, in which 8,000 Muslim men were taken away into the woods and murdered uh, in that town of Srebrenica. Uh, what about Radovan Karadzic? He's a great example of what happens when you have a charismatic leader, because that's what he was. He's a psychologist, would you believe? And he's also a, a quite a gifted poet and a speaker and so forth. Uh, his people followed him. Well, he was also a racist. He believed that Croatians and uh, Bosnian Muslims and so forth should be driven out of any area where the Serbs lived in Bosnia because it was a country that had Croatians and Bosnian Muslims and Serbs and they were all living together in, in harmony. But then he said, no, 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 the Serb area has to separate off, become part of Syria, and we're going to drive all these other people out. 
What did they use to drive them out? They used genocide. They would kill large numbers of the Bosnian Muslims or the Croats and put them in concentration camps and so forth. They would terrorize them into leaving. So they had both what we call genocide and they also had what uh, Milosevic called, quote, ethnic cleansing, a term I hate because he was an inventor of it. It's really called forced displacement in international law, and forced displacement is a crime against humanity. That's what it should have been called. That's what happened in Bosnia, and they were the architects of it. Now, the question then arises, was it the leader, Karadzic, and the, he the general, Milotic, who were really the only ones at fault here? No. There were a lot of others, too. You need a population that's receptive to that kind of hatred. That's what made the Holocaust possible. In Germany, they had a long tradition of what we call anti-Semitism being against Jews in Germany. Even Martin Luther was a terrible anti-Jewish uh, thinker. Um, if you have a long tradition like that, it makes it quite possible for a charismatic leader like Adolf Hitler uh, or uh, Karadzic or Milodic or uh, Milosevic or some of these other people to get them to follow them and say we have to get rid of these people or else they're going to try to kill us. That's the common argument, that it's kind of a self-defense. You know, if we don't do it to them first, then they'll do it to us. It's the opposite, by the way, of the golden rule. Think about that. This is uh, the golden rule, as you know. I mean, it's uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's the basis of morality in every major religion. Uh, the self-defense argument is do it to them first before they do it to us. And it results in what's called a kind of mirroring, mirroring. I mean, that you say they will do it to you, and therefore that justifies you do it to them, even if they haven't done it to you yet. Can I it's called mirroring because you do to them as though you're looking in a mirror and saying, well, no, no, that, they're going to do it to us first, so we better do it first. That is the kind of logic in genocide. Okay, so then other can people ask me, question? okay, what about... Uh, can I yeah? ask a quick question? Sure. About that mirroring? Yes, of course. It, it's That seems to really fit that pattern of those big genocides that you're talking about. But what about in a situation like, say, East Timor, or a lot of the conflicts that you have um, in a place like uh, Chiapas or in, in Guatemala, it, those seem a right. little bit different. Like it's more like a dominant sort of culture against uh, a minority indigenous cultures or is that, the, do you see the same That's patterns right. there? Well, <coughs> yeah, it is the same actually because um, in, for example, Guatemala and in Mexico, in Chiapas, um, the argument was that the Mayans in Chiapas and in Guatemala uh, have been organized by communists, uh, communist revolutionaries who were bent on uh, overthrowing our government and uh, they really want to kill us all. So that mirroring argument actually does apply in that case. And it was dominant so. That is common in genocidal societies. You'll have one group being dominant over the other, and then taking that dominance to its logical extreme by actually killing off the other. That's what we did against Native Americans. We said, okay, we don't want these other people among us, so we're going to send them all off to reservations out in Oklahoma. And then, of course, we realized there's a lot of oil out there and a whole lot of other stuff, and so we said, oh, no, wait a minute, we're taking that reservation. And we basically broke all the treaties that we had with Indians. Because we said, oh, my goodness, we gave... Oh, hey, gold in those black hills. Uh, we better take that away from the Lakota Sioux. And they did. So that you have that kind of a, you're right, domination uh, in the culture. And then that becomes a way, an excuse, 
underlying excuse to commit genocide. Now, you talk about East Timor, and let's just talk about that one. East Timor had been taken over by Indonesia after the Portuguese had let it become independent. Portugal decided it didn't want any more colonies, too much work, too much expenditure, and so forth. And they had a new kind of government in Portugal that, as opposed to a right-wing dictatorship, they actually had a socialist government that overthrew it. And so they let the colonies go free. Well, East Timor was one of them. Indonesia said, look, that's always been part of our country because they already owned West Timor. That was part of Indonesia. They said, we're just going to take East Timor, too. So they just moved their troops in. In doing so, they killed at least 100,000 people in East Timor. Then when the United Nations wouldn't let them do that and set up a vote about whether East Timor was independent, a vote that was won by independence people by well over 80 percent of the vote, then Indonesia said, well, that's enough of that. We organized militias, and we're not going to let you become independent. And so they, with the encouragement of the Indonesian government, armed and provided support to these militias to start carrying out a genocide in East Timor. That, by the way, was one of the first genocides that Genocide Watch, this organization that I founded in 1999, got involved in. We organized a working group to really take that one on. And we got, I should say we got, I mean a lot of people got, Australia and ASEAN, that's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, to put together a military force to intervene in East Timor to stop it. And not only that, we got the U.S. government, because I was there at the time, I went in to see the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon, and he was very sensitive to this issue. Well, the U.S. was the main supporter of the Indonesian military. And we brought with us, when we met with him, General Chalikashvili, whose background is Georgian. He's from the former Soviet Union. It's not himself, but his family. He was very sensitive to this problem of genocide. We brought with us a nun who had just come from East Timor, who actually watched a church get burnt down with 200 people inside. She told General Chalikashvili what she had seen. General Chalikashvili began to cry, began to weep. And he said to one of his people who was next to him, he said, get me General Wiranto, that was the head of the Indonesian military, on the phone. And they did. And I stood there and I actually heard this with my own ears. He said, General Wiranto, stop it now. What you're doing in East Timor, stop it now. And after that, it became possible for that Australian-led ASEAN military force to go into East Timor without opposition from the Indonesian military, to actually go down with UN permission. We got a UN resolution to permit them to do this, to stop that genocide. Now, that's a really important case of successful intervention. It resulted, of course, a lot less killing. We actually held trials for some of the leaders of that genocide. We didn't get, of course, the main people. I mean, we didn't get some of the Indonesian generals who really were behind it, and probably never will. And, you know, people say, well, you know, it was a big failure because you didn't get those folks. I wrote an article once about the Cambodian genocide because they were making the same argument about that. And the article was entitled, 
Perfection is the enemy of justice. It was an argument that said, look, we can't get everybody, we know that, but at least we can get some people. And those people will be an example for everybody else. They'll be an example that you can't get away with mass murder. And that's exactly what the East Timor Tribunal proved. It's what the Rwanda Tribunal has proved. It's what the Cambodian Tribunal has proved. It is the reason why we organize these tribunals. Because then it's not just a question of making denial really uh, basically impossible. Uh, it's also setting an example and saying, if you, or if you think you're going to get away with this, just wait. We'll get you. You're going to be sitting in the dock someday. And that's, of course, exactly what has happened to some of these leaders. Charles Taylor in Liberia and Sierra Leone. Another great movie I recommend highly to you uh, is a movie about Lima Gabaldi, a woman who was a fish seller in the market in Monrovia, Liberia, who got together with her woman friends and they began to pray for peace every Friday in that fish market. And the prayer group got bigger and bigger and bigger until they had 5,000 people, 5,000 women praying at once in that marketplace. You know, Charles Taylor cruises by in his Mercedes Benz limousines and stuff like that and laughs and so forth. Well, finally, he realized this is a movement. I've got to deal with these people. They got him. Uh, they got him, uh, you know, to meet with them. And um, that is exactly then when he agreed to go to Ghana and negotiate a peace agreement. Well, on the first day of the negotiations, he was indicted by the Sierra Leone Tribunal for genocide and crimes against humanity. And he ran away. He fled. And he's never been back. And then he was finally put on, on trial by a special chamber of that tribunal, the Sierra Leone Tribunal, in The Hague, because it was safer there. He could actually be held in prison and not escape. He had escaped from other prisons, including one of ours, by the way, in Boston, in, in Cambridge. <laughs> and uh, he was put on trial, and he is now, uh, you know, in prison for life. And guess what? Those women proceeded to elect the first woman president of an African country. You've got to watch that movie. It's called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Pray the Devil Back to Hell. It's made by Abigail Disney. It's one of the most inspirational movies you'll ever see. I've met Lee McBowder. I've met some of these people. Um, uh, can we just interrupt for so, a second? Um, I, yeah. I, you are inspiring, and, and uh, these guys are incredibly patient. We only have like six minutes left in class, or maybe even less. Oh, Time flies, I'm right? sorry, yeah, thank you. No, 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 it's okay. Yeah, it has. Um, I just was wondering no, if you guys should ask, um, had any questions, right? Oh, uh, sure they do. I mean, do you guys have any right off the top of your head right now? I haven't begun to answer yeah, all the like, questions you sent me. I know. I, I can't help but think about um, the questions that are sort of toward the bottom of the list that involve. Yeah. Well, if you want our own. Country. Listen, Keith. If you want to, if you want to meet again, I'll do it. <laughs> Can we <laughs> have yes, please. Or we can go over. Do you, Do you want to <laughs> meet uh, uh, for half the period tomorrow morning? Would you be available to do that? Half. <laughs> Or all of it. I Absolutely. Know. I mean, I would. Yeah, um, I'd say uh, yeah, I'd just deal with the rest of these questions and maybe take the whole. I'm really sorry to have just no, talked no. too much. You're I really. No, 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 but I, really, I meant to have much more involvement by the class, so uh, please, let's do that. Let's do it tomorrow morning. That's fantastic. You're incredibly generous. <laughs> Are you kidding? This is, this is what I live for. I really do. It's for you, for you students. Awesome. I love to teach. You probably know. Oh yes. <laughs> and it's not it's not gonna snow tonight, so we'll actually have school tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's wonderful. Okay. okay. <laughs>
Um, so how about we just, uh, why don't you maybe say one thing so we're ready to wrap up for today, um, and then we'll meet again tomorrow morning. Good. Anyway, there may be other, there may be what questions that I can answer in the next minute or two. Okay. Come on. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Do economics always play a role in general? Did you hear that? You know, you know, you'll need to repeat. Please. Okay. Do economics always play a role in genocide? Yes, always. Uh, you know, we are economic beings. I mean, people need to eat uh, and uh, produce and make food and produce goods and things. And so the people who control the economic system um, sometimes want to have total control over it. And so some societies that become totalitarian, for instance, the leaders really want to control everything. That's why the most dangerous societies for genocide are ones in which you have totalitarian governments. That's why the Nazis were so dangerous. That's why the uh, the communists have been so dangerous. Communism, by far, the most murderous ideology in human history. Uh, it, you know, it has killed 60 million people in the Soviet Union. It's killed over 60 million in Red China. That is a lot of people. And of course, it killed three million in maybe three million in Cambodia, other places too. So, yes, economics always has an impact. Um, and it did, again, in, even in Rwanda, where the Hutus wanted to keep control. They didn't want the Tutsis to uh, be able to share power. Yeah, ironically, isn't that uh, how Marx begins the Communist Manifesto? Yeah. Yes. You know, Marx realized how important economics are. Uh, now, I'm not a Marxist because I think his prescription, you know, communism, uh, was wrong. Uh, but he was right in some of his analyses, namely that economics is going to affect politics. We've seen that here in this country. I mean, look at the billionaires who um, put so much money into the last election that they managed to swing the election. Now, there were other factors, I know that. But, I mean, it was huge, the, the amount of money they put in. And so you can't... Uh, ever discount, you know, uh, economics. And do we have a question? One more, and then we'll. I, I, I doubt we'll get to it, but I, I kind of want to hear about my uh, question on if I could buy a genocide or not. Um, or and if so, can I? I love that. Can I buy one to stop? Yes. So yeah. It's a very, it's a very good question. I'd like to discuss it more tomorrow, but you know, the answer is yes. And if you want to look at a genocide that was purchased, look at Guatemala. Uh, the uh, United Fruit Company decided that it was it didn't want to lose its land. It owned 42 percent of the land in Guatemala, and they had a liberal government that wanted to redistribute that land to peasants. Well, guess what? The United Fruit Company and Gen and President Eisenhower and others said, "Okay, we're going to overthrow that government." So they overthrew the Arbenz government, which was a democratically elected government, and that began a civil war that lasted for 36 years and resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths. We supported the military in Guatemala about that, and we supported the military during the genocide in Guatemala under Rio Smock. Answer, yes, you can buy a genocide. And, the question and is, can you end the genocide? Eisenhower's brother-in-law was on the board of United Food. That's right. And the CIA was really behind that, and guess what? Okay. Eisenhower's brother was also the head of the CIA. Uh, you know, we have a lot of, I'm sorry, uh, Dulles, Eisenhower Secretary of State's brother, was the head of the CIA, right. Alan Dulles. Anyway, we really, uh, and, and the answer is to your other question, can you put in enough money to actually end Genesis? is an unanswerable question right now because we haven't yet done it, of course. But I am convinced that with enough resources given to the anti-genocide movement and most of the volunteer work, it's not really money, it's people. Yes, I do believe we can end genocide. Not maybe, you know, all genocide, but most genocide. 
just the way the anti-slavery movement did in this country. It ended slavery. And it took volunteer work by literally thousands of people to do that. And it took money, but it mainly was the will of thousands of people who went around. And it was a really, uh, it took a lot of guts to do that. I happen to know that because my great, 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 great grandfather, Henry Brewster Stanton, was the vice president of the World Anti-Slavery Movement. And if, if you were against slavery in those days, back in the 1840s, you really put your life on the line. Uh, well, it's a battle that can be won.